Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation about Leap Camera. For those of you who are lucky enough to join us live from Seattle today, thank you for waking up early. This is the first lot of the day so I know how difficult it can be. My name is Laurent Panchard, I'm the Chief Architect and Project Manager of Leap Camera and today I'm going to take you on Leap Camera's fabulous journey. So let's dive into the subject. Before we actually start talking about Leap Camera itself, I think it's important to understand the context and where camera support in Linux came from. What you're seeing on, this, on the screen is my very first webcam. It's made of a VHS camcorder connected through a composite video cable to a PCI capture card. It was very bulky. It's, it required an actual tape inside a camcorder to operate, but it did the job. After a month of reverse engineering, it even worked on Linux. Uh, that was my idea for well-spent free time in those days. And after a brief period of crazy ideas, such as connecting cameras to the printer parallel port, which Linux actually supported, at the end of the 20th century, the world moved to USB-connected cameras. For all purpose but nostalgia, it was a very good idea. What did all those devices have in common? A large portion of them had Linux drivers. They were mostly developed through reverse engineering. And all those drivers implemented the Video for Linux API. Now, in the rest of this presentation, I will use the words Video for Linux, V4L and V4L2 completely interchangeably. Uh, but the old V4L1 API is only of interest to historians. Video for Linux is a broad API with lots of features to accommodate different kinds of video capture devices, from TV grabbers to webcams, it's fairly monolithic, uh, in the sense that it tries to apply the same model to all those devices. As a result, an application that supports V4L2 will likely work with TV grabbers and webcams alike, uh, at least for the basic features. V4L is also fairly high level because it maps directly to the features that those devices implement and expose. My camcorder, for instance, handled all the gory details of auto exposure and auto white balance internally, and the USB webcams followed the same model. So v 2 was designed to map to those features and didn't have to care about what happened internally under the hood inside the cameras. So what happened next? Fast forward about five years, the industry standardized on a common USB protocol for webcams. That was in 2003. It took about two years to develop a Linux driver for that. Uh, it was my humble first real steps in the Linux kernel world, and it got merged in the kernel in 2008. As virtually all new webcams were expected to implement the USB video class, I thought that the camera support in Linux was sold once and for good. The future proved me completely wrong. What did I miss? Well, not all cameras were connected over USB. Linux was gaining fast adoption in the embedded world, and, uh, and there the situation was very different. In embedded devices, cameras are made of an image sensor that outputs data on a dedicated hardware interface, such as MIPCSI2, for instance, in today's devices. The SOC, the processor that is running Linux, integrates a receiver compatible with that interface, which then transfers images to memory using DMA. Unlike in webcams, both the camera sensor and the receiver are directly controlled by Linux. What implications does this have? Well, to answer the question, we need to understand what a camera actually is. At the core of a camera, as you likely all expect, is an imaging sensor. This is a device that, broadly speaking, converts light into digital values. It is made of tiny light-sensitive photodiodes with the electronics required to convert the charge into a voltage. Each of them has a micro lens to gather as much light as possible, as possible into the diode, and those are what we call pixels. The pixels are assembled into an array with rows and columns, and additional electronics to route the voltage of each pixel, one after the other, to an analog amplifier, and then an analog to digital converter. The sensor thus outputs a digital value for each pixel that's proportional to the amount of light that has reached the photodiode. And this is our first trouble. The diodes are sensitive to an amount of light, so they produce a grayscale image. How do we even get colors? Well, colors are related to physical properties of the light and its spectral contents. 
But it's very important here to realize that the concept of color is deeply tied to the human eye and the perception that the human eye has of light. Without going into too much details, let's just remember that color, pro color processing in a camera is mostly about outputting images that appear as realistic as possible to the human eye. What most camera sensors do is simply put a tiny color filter in front of each pixel with the colors corresponding to the sensitivity of the human eye to red, green, and blue. The most common arrangement of such filters groups them in cells of two by two pixels with one red, one blue, and two green filters because the eye is more sensitive to green than red or blue. This color filter array uh, arrangement is called a bio pattern. Let's look at the impact this has on the image. Image 1 shows a sample scene that we can then capture with a 120 by 80 pixels biosensor. Image 2 shows the values of all captured pixels. As you can see from the red flower, for instance, we have a checker pattern of light and dark pixels. The light pixels correspond to the ones with a red filter, which lets the red light through while the dark pixels correspond to the green and blue filters, which block most of the red light. Image 3 shows the exact same image, but with each pixel colorized with the color of the corresponding filter, so that you can see a bit better what's happening. We can see that color information is present, but each pixel misses two out of the three color channels. This leads to the typical checker pattern of colorized bio, colorized bio images. Image 4, then, is obtained by interpolating the missing color components using the values of neighboring pixels. For instance, a red pixel in the image is surrounded by four green pixels above, below, on the left, and on the right. So its green value can be estimated by taking the average of those four green neighbors. In practice, to obtain a good image quality, we need more complex interpolation, uh, and we need to take into account more neighbors with uh, more complex mathematical operations, but the base principles still apply. It would be very easy if it stopped there. You see, there's more processing that needs to be applied to the image to achieve an acceptable quality. This is called in part by imperfections in the optics and in the camera sensor. Uh, for instance, as shown here, the lens will let less light through on the periphery than in the center, which causes an undesired vignetting eff effect. You can see that the corners of the image are darker than the center. There are plenty of other issues. The sensor may have defective pixels, for instance, that will need to be hidden. Um, the total absence of light, when the scene is completely dark, isn't rendered black because there are leakage currents in the photodiode. Uh, there's also noise that will affect the image at all stages from the photodiode to the analog to digital conversion, and the list goes on and on. So images need to go through a complex camera pipeline, which is way too expensive to implement in software in real time. Cameras that thus need hardware assistance, and this is provided by specialized devices called image signal processors, or ISP in short. And if you thought this was complex enough, it's not all. The luminance of the scene in front of the camera typically varies constantly. You can have a cloud passing in front of the sun, for instance. This requires adjusting the integration time and the gain of the sensor accordingly to produce an image that is neither underexposed or overexposed. The same is true for white balance, for instance, which requires adjusting the color gains based on the light of the scene, or for the focus, as people will have a tendency to move in front of the camera. The parameters that control the lens, uh, the sensor, and the ISP, they all need to be computed in real time, and that needs to be based on the analysis of the capture images. This is again very computationally intensive, but fortunately for us, the ISP comes to the rescue by computing statistics uh, on the images, such as histograms, for instance. Based on those statistics, the algorithms will then compute the processing parameters for the next frame and apply them to the device. The same process is repeated for every frame forever. Those algorithms are often referred to as 3A for auto-exposure, uh, auto auto-white balance, and autofocus, but they can include more processing than that. All of this is really key to getting the final quality of the image. Last but not least, the algorithms need to be calibrated and tuned for every combination of a camera sensor and the optics. This adds even more complexity to the development process. Now, 
do we really have to implement all these fire cameras? Fortunately for us, no. There are sensors that embed an ISP and a microcontroller to run the algorithms inside a sensor. They are called smart sensor or YUV sensors because they output processed images in YUV format uh, as opposed to the raw sensors or non-smart sensors that output unprocessed Bayer images. On a side note, USB webcams most of the time use smart sensors and when they don't, they integrate a separate ISP internally inside the camera. Uh, and integrated webcams in laptops are also USB devices, so that's why Linux didn't have to care so far. Everything was handled on the hardware side, on the device side, under the hood. So the day saved. We can use a smart sensor, we can connect it to the SOC. There's a bit more to deal with than with a USB webcam because the camera receiver inside the SOC may have additional features, such as the ability to scale, for instance. Still, the complexity of the camera pipeline is very limited. And it can all be exposed through Video for Linux because it supports scaling already and all the features that are required for these embedded pipelines. Existing Video for Linux applications can keep using the exact same API and they can be completely unaware that the SOC has a scaler inside the SOC, not inside the camera sensor. Uh, everything works like if the embedded camera was a webcam. Then trouble happened. This is the Nokia N900. It's one of the first Linux phones from a large manufacturer. It's very special because it marks the beginning of the whole leap camera journey. You will ask me, how can a phone released in 2009 mark the beginning of leap camera, which was announced nearly 10 years later in 2018? That's a very good question. You see, the N900 is based on an OMAP3 SOC from Texas Instruments. Its camera architecture uses raw bio sensors connected to the ISP inside the OMAP3. This marks the turning point of Linux having to care about all the complexity of image processing. All that I just explained, all the required processing, is something that no Linux had to be aware about and to implement. Back then, I was working with the Nokia camera kernel team on drivers for the OMAP3 ISP. Video for Linux wasn't ready for this use case, uh, it was missing features, so we designed and developed a new API called the Media Controller API, along with many v 2 extensions to expose the full set of features of the ISP to user space. This is all nice for the kernel, but not for applications. Applications had to program the sensors, uh, program the ISP parameters. They had to capture the raw images. They had to pass those raw images to the ISP. They had to capture the processed frames at the output of the ISP, capture the statistics as well, and implement all the image processing algorithms that I mentioned before. Uh, all this has to be device dependent as well, because different ISPs behave quite differently, and algorithms cannot be generalized. They cannot be portable between different, uh, different devices. The idea of portable video for Linux applications that would work with different cameras got completely shattered at that point. Nokia had the resources to develop a custom camera stack in user space. It was partly open source, partly proprietary. It was based on GStreamer, actually, at the time. Uh, also had the resources to develop custom applications. But this was beyond the reach of most developers. Whether hobbyists or working for small or medium-sized companies, the complexity was just not manageable if you wanted to develop a camera application running on that. We envisioned solutions to this problem. We didn't develop kernel drivers without caring about user space, um, so we had designs that were based on platform-specific plugins for libv4l, for instance, which was the default to wrapper uh, library in user space. Oops, sorry. But unfortunately, on February 11th, in 2011, Nokia decided to cancel its line of Linux-based mobile phones and switch to Windows Phone. Development of user space solutions completely stopped at that point. From 2011, Linux was without an embedded camera stack. Development continued on the kernel side, but nobody could or would commit enough resources to fix the situation in user space. Meanwhile, new devices got developed with raw camera sensors and an ISP in the SOC. Uh, this architecture was spreading from phones to ARM-based tablets, for instance, 
and from tablets to laptops, even on Intel-based devices. This particular laptop, for instance, uses a RAW sensor with an Intel Kaby Lake SoC that integrates on ISP. Why did vendors decide to use RAW sensors and not smart sensors or USB webcams integrated inside a device case? Was it pure masochism? Well, it turns out that there are multiple reasons. They are related to cost, for instance, uh, to size, because a USB webcam module can be quite thick, so it requires size to, inter to integrate it in, inside the laptop, but most importantly, to image quality and to features. You see, with a RAW sensor, no silicon space is used on the sensor itself to implement an ISP, so we can achieve larger pixel sizes and larger resolutions, and possibly uh, because the pixels uh, are larger, you can also have um, a better light sensitivity, for instance. And with a separate controllable ISP, the vendors can implement more advanced image algorithms. They have full control on those algorithms. A couple of very simple examples are, for instance, um, focus assistance based on face detection, uh, where you would run algorithms that detect faces in the image and then automatically focus on them, or advanced HDR processing. There are many more complex use cases that exist as well. As those features can be fairly advanced, they are often considered by vendors as a key differentiating factor that needs to be covered by the utmost secrecy. This makes embedded cameras and free software very unlikely friends. At the end of 2018, after contacts with the industry over the summer, we announced the Lip Camera Project. The goals were ambitious. Leap Camera was to provide a complete user space camera stack with a new native API and a feature set that would at least match the capabilities of the Android camera API. This was way beyond, by the way, what Video for Linux supported natively. And of course, it had to be free software. While our initial team was actually coming from kernel development, we wanted to focus as much as possible on user space. Um, and LeapCamera thus uses the existing V4L and media controller kernel drivers. It does not come with a new kernel API. LeapCamera had to handle camera enumeration and support multiple cameras concurrently. And it also had to support multiple concurrent streams per camera to be able to capture the same frame in different resolutions and formats. This way, an application can, for instance, obtain a stream with the native screen resolution to display it locally, and a second stream with a different resolution for the purpose of video recording or streaming, for instance. Leap Camera would support per-frame controls. Uh, this means it would guarantee to applications that control parameters get applied precisely to the requested frame. And, of course, Leap Camera had to control ISPs, so it would need to implement image processing algorithms. We have seen how those algorithms are some of the most protect, protected vendor IP, so we decided to isolate them in plugins that we named Image Processing Algorithm Modules, or IPA modules. This architecture allowed vendors to provide closed source implementation of algorithms that can coexist with the open source implementations, even for the same platform. We will see later in this presentation how this was done without compromising on the ability to use cameras with free software only. Even though Leap Camera offers a native API, right from the beginning we considered the need to be backward compatible with existing APIs to facilitate Leap Camera's adoption. In particular, we wanted Leap Camera to be usable with most VFL2 applications without having to even recompile them. We will also see later how that was achieved. We also considered as a main goal support for Android and Chrome OS, which are both based on the same Android Camera API. For those who are not familiar with the camera implementation on Android, um, Android defines an API for camera provider modules that is named the Camera Hardware Abstraction Layer, or HAL. They require the device vendors to provide a camera HAL implementation, and then Android builds the camera service on top of that HAL implementation. With a single implementation of the Android Camera HAL based on the camera, we can support both operating systems, Android and Chrome OS. So at the end of 2018, we had a goal, we had an architecture, and plenty of motivation. The adventure at that point could begin. We started development by targeting two very different devices initially. Our main goal was the, our main goal was the ISP found in the Intel Kaby Lake SOCs, which is named IPU3. 
We picked a Chromebook device as a development platform, as it had an open source firmware implementation. Uh, it has also kernel drivers and a supportive team at Google. We will see later why the open firmware is actually important. The second targeted device was, well, any plain old UVC compatible webcam. While the webcams don't benefit so much from lead camera as the ISPs, for the reason we've seen before, we wanted to show that the camera stack could also perfectly support what most Linux users are using today. From the very beginning, we decided that tests, and in particular unit tests, were crucial to the success of the project. I cannot emphasize more strongly how the decision turned out to be right. The project would have completely collapsed from regressions all the time if we didn't have that. To support unit testing of the Leap Camera Core without the need for a particular hardware platform, the first device that we actually supported was the virtual media controller device, uh, which is called VIMC. And that was before we even implemented support for the IPO3 or for, uh, for UVC webcams. VIMC is a kernel module that emulates a camera sensor and a camera receiver without having a real hardware device. Uh, it has been extremely useful for testing in the camera. Shortly afterwards, we added one final device to the set uh, with the ISP found in the Rockchip RK3399. Its architecture is quite different compared to the IPU3, and we wanted to test the Leap Camera design with different device architectures to make sure that it could support them all. Our initial development device was also a Chromebook uh, for that SOC, but the same code works exactly the same on, on other RK3399 machines, such as the RockPi4 development board, for instance. Uh, at that point, something unexpected happened. Among the platforms that we hadn't considered for the camera was Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi released their first camera module in 2013 with a camera stack that was implemented in a closed source firmware that was out of reach of Linux and, as a consequence, a consequence out of reach of Leap Camera as well. The Raspberry Pi user base, however, wanted better access to the internals of the, of the camera system. And Raspberry Pi listened to them. They had the code to control the camera pipeline. They had a complete implementation of image processing algorithms for that platform. And they had a will to open source it. But what they were missing was a standard camera stack for Linux that could host those components. And that's where LibCamera comes into picture. So Raspberry Pi got in touch with us towards the end of 2019. We worked together for about six months, and which, to be fair, was really mostly them doing the work with our guidance. And in May 2020, they announced the new camera stack based on the camera. The code they released was, as far as I know, the world's first open source production quality implementation of image processing algorithms for an ISP. Along with that came a tuning tool and very detailed documentation as well. This made the Raspberry Pi a great platform and playground for image processing algorithm development. It was the world's first, and even if nobody noticed at the time, we knew it was a major milestone. Lead Camera had its first experience of collaboration and its first real users. The second unexpected encounter was indirectly due to Microsoft. We knew about Windows-based laptops with, with an IPU3, and we knew they would be challenging to support. You see, the Linux kernel needs to know what camera sensors are present in the system and how they are connected to the system, and, it's, and it needs to control the power to turn them on and off. On the x86 machines, this is normally handled by the ACPI firmware, which describes the hardware and controls the power automatically. However, on those machines, unlike on the Chromebooks, the ACPI description is very badly designed. It's missing critical information, and it requires drivers to implement power management manually. Without support from the device manufacturer, which we didn't have, without access to the schematics, which we didn't have either, without firmware on Windows driver source code, there was really little that could be done to support those machines. That's where the Linux Surface community comes into play. They are a set of users turned into developers who had different Microsoft Surface machines, and they team together to try and get Linux up and running on them. Needless to say, they were not pleased with the lack of camera support. 
They studied the camera ACPI description. They went to reverse engineer the firmware to obtain the missing information. We helped them with that. Uh, and it ended up requiring a significant effort to understand what was going on behind the hood uh, in the firmware side. After great work on the kernel side from some of the community members and nearly being driven crazy by ACPI atrocities, they managed to get the sensors detected. Lead camera was at that point ready to capture the first images, uh, images from those devices. And that's how they look like. You see, at the time, Lead camera had support for the IPU3, but no corresponding image processing algorithms. And without the IPAs, this is how bad it gets. Still, it was a breakthrough achievement, and I really wouldn't have bet on that six months earlier. Far from being discouraged by the appalling quality, the users tried to hack around to improve it. Some of them even got a bit poetic, actually. A user noticed that pictures had a tendency to be very purple in low light conditions and very green in bright light conditions. So that user took a picture through the window on a bright day and this part of the picture was named The Sky After Rain with Leaf. The story doesn't tell if it was later sold as a non-fungible token. Art is great, but it doesn't make for a great webcam. So we decided to fix this, and one of our developers spent a few months implementing initial algorithms for the IPU3. This is what he achieved. As you can see, this is lots of room for improvement. For instance, to address the lens shading, uh, the corners are definitely darker than the image center. But the result starts looking like a camera. So at that point, more than two years of work had gone into the camera. This underlies my earlier point. Without a user space camera framework, the development effort to, to write a camera application, two years, is simply not realistic. Still, this reality isn't widely known among Linux users. This screenshot, for instance, shows a bounty for the camera support in Linux on the Microsoft Surface machines. $810 to cover all the kernel and user space development, a multi-year work, that's a bit of an effort underestimation. Of course, lots of free software gets developed by, developed by hobbyists and the free time for free. And the community has great talents. Uh, this can be seen, for instance, by the amazing GPU reverse engineering projects. Nonetheless, with the number of different ISPs on the market today, and with the fact that new ones are being developed all the time, solving the issue of camera support on Linux will definitely require involving camera vendors. The journey leads us to today. What have we achieved? What have we done so far with the camera? And what are we busy working on? I think it's fair to say, to start with, that we have managed to create a user space camera stack for Linux. At the central piece of the stack, we have a camera manager. It can enumerate all media devices in the system. It supports hot plug to notify applications of camera addition and removal. And the camera manager pairs the media devices that are detected in the system with the device-specific backends that we call the pipeline handlers. The pipeline handlers, in turn, create one or more cameras and register them with the camera manager. From that point, the cameras are visible to applications and they're ready to be used. So how does it work behind the scenes? As we've seen before, a camera needs a complex pipeline of operations. So to support this, the device-specific backend is split in two parts. First, we have the pipeline handler. This is the code that is responsible for all the interactions with kernel devices. It configures data routing inside the devices, it manages internal memory buffers, it handles image captures. Um, overall, it abstracts the details of device operation and exposes the video streams to applications. The pipeline handler doesn't implement the image processing algorithms that produce the ISP parameters. This task is performed by the separate IPA module. The module passes statistics produced by the hardware, and it computes parameters for the sensor and the ISP. IPA modules do not have direct access to kernel devices. That's a very important architecture limitation that's, uh, that we have put in place in the camera. 
The only way to communicate with the rest of the system is through, is through the pipeline handler. They will receive the statistics and other metadata from the pipeline handler, and they will send the computed parameters back to the pipeline handler. The parameters will then be applied the, to the device, uh, which means that IPA modules cannot cheat. They cannot go and access undocumented device interfaces behind the scenes. They are bound by what the pipeline handler implements. The IPA modules are implemented as shared objects that are loaded dynamically, uh, which, as I mentioned before, allows the, co the coexistence of IPA modules developed by the LibCamera project and third-party modules supplied by camera vendors, whether they would be closed source or open source. We allow vendors to supply closed source IPA modules, but then we sandbox them in a separate process to make sure that they will not affect system stability. And we enforce the rule that they must not communicate with devices directly. This does not mean that LibCamera requires closed source component to function. The pipeline handler is part of the LibCamera core and it's open source. Its communication protocol with the IP module is documented and we also require vendors to provide an open IP module implementation that enables at least image capture with a basic image quality. The format of the ISP parameters, of the statistics as well, uh, must be documented. Uh, and this enables the community to then start with the basic IPA module and uh, write free software implementations of algorithms and improve them. We also minimize the impact of sandboxing to keep, to keep development simple. The IPC mechanism to communicate with the IPA module process is handled completely transparently for both the IPA handler and the IPA, uh, for both the pipeline handler, sorry, and the IPA module. To further ease development, LibCamera provides a large set of helper classes. Uh, they cover various areas such as wrappers for the VFL2 and media control API, such as pixel format abstractions, uh, threading and message passing helpers, uh, a logging infrastructure, and the list goes on. These are not areas where anyone innovates, uh, but today everybody, every vendor, ends up reinventing the same wheel in the camera stack. With Leap Camera, the vendors can rely on well-tested helpers and they can focus solely on the pipeline handler and the IPA modules where the real added value is. All of this exposes cameras to applications through the Leap Camera native API. But Leap Camera offers more than that. The adaptation layer that sits on top of the native API interfaces Leap Camera with other APIs and frameworks. Because all the device-specific code is located in the pipeline handler and in the IPA module, the adaptation layer is implemented once and works on all devices. In no particular order, uh, the first component in the adaptation layer is an Android Camera HAL module, which implements a camera provider for the Android Camera service. It gives free Android support for any platform supported by the camera. So once again, we have one implementation of an Android Camera HAL module inside the camera, and it supports any device that has a pipeline handler and an IPA module. As mentioned earlier, because Chrome OS uses the same Camera HAL module API as Android, Lead Camera also supports Chrome OS out of the box. The second adaptation component is a GStreamer source element called Lead Camera Source. It provides multi-stream capture and GStreamer pipelines for any camera supported by Lead Camera. It has been successfully tested, for instance, with Cheese, the GNOME camera application. The last adaptation component that we have in the camera implements uh, VFL2 emulation. It allows, it allows existing VFL2 applications to use Leap Camera without any, modifi any modification, without even being recompiled. So this can be used with closed source applications as well. And we achieve this with a shared object that is preloaded inside the application and, and that intercepts all the calls to the C library. When it detects that those calls attempt to access a VFL2 device, it will then redirect them to the VFL2 emulation code that translates the calls to the LibCamera API. This is a best effort approach because it's really impossible to fully emulate 100% of VFL2, so we can't have complete API coverage. Uh, but we have implemented the most used features and we have, for instance, successfully made video calls with Firefox using this technique. 
Let's summarize the currently supported features in one slide. We have a camera stack. It supports multiple cameras with multiple streams per camera and buffering controls and hot plug. The list of supported devices is limited, but it's growing, with our flagship implementation being Raspberry Pi today. Raspberry Pi and IP3 both have an IP module, and the last two devices on the list, uh, NXP and, and Allwina, um, <clears throat> don't have an EISP, so only smart uh, sensors can be used with them. We've just seen the three components of the adaptation layer, with GStreamer, Android, and VFOL2 being supported. Um, LibCamera also includes tools, such as a camera tuning tool for Raspberry Pi, for instance, and a tracing infrastructure for debugging. We have three sample applications, one command line application that implements all supported features, one graphical user interface application, and one simple application that we use as a tutorial to show how to implement a LibCamera native application. We have extensive documentation on the API with 100% coverage, as well as high-level tutorials and guides. The API documentation is published on the LibCamera website with nightly builds, so you can get it from there. Uh, the guides are currently available from the source code repository only. They can be compiled to HTML and we will publish them on the website too. Many developers are better at coding than writing documentation. I'm sure many of you are aware of that fact. Uh, when developers do not viscerally hate it completely. Documentation takes time. It's, it's an investment. But one of the lessons that LibCamera taught me is that it pays off to enforce a good documentation policy from day one. We are of course not sitting idle. We are working on support for additional platforms. Uh, this includes an SOC from MediaTek used in many IoT applications. The ISP is left out for the time being, so only smart sensors can be used with the platform right now. We have also started implementing support for the NXP IMX 8M+. This is the first SOC from NXP that includes an ISP, and here we're targeting the ISP support already. Another platform that we've started looking at is the Librem 5 phone. It's based on raw sensors, but doesn't have a hardware ISP. So we're exploring implement uh, the implementation of a software ISP that would be running on the GPU, because a software implementation running on the CPU would be way too slow. There's more work in progress. We're improving IP modules for the Intel IP3 and the Rockchip ISP, uh, with the goal to bring the quality on par with the Raspberry Pi algorithms. We are also extending the LibCamera API with new features and new use cases. And at the same time, we're cleaning the API to move towards the first 1.0 release. That's a big, scary milestone. There's lots of work in progress on the Android camera HAL implementation as well to pass the Android conformance test suite. And we're also implementing Python bindings for LibCamera to support sorry, new communities of users. Uh, we expect that bindings for other languages will also be developed in the future. Uh, I'm sure that uh, some of you in the audience are thinking about Rust already, for instance. On the integration side, we have a prototype of native camera support for the Chrome Chromium web browser. This is a screenshot of a video call in Chromium with Jean-Michel, one of our developers on the top right, who's using a Surface Go 2 running camera. This is running an old version of Flip Camera from before we had IP3 algorithms, which explain why the image is very green. Today, the quality is much better, and you would actually not notice that Flip Camera is involved if I took a new screenshot of uh, what we can do today. This, I think, is likely how we will judge uh, if Flip Camera is successful in the end. We'll have done a good job if users don't even notice it exists. Another part of the work that is not very visible is our participation in the industry initiatives. We are an active member of the Embedded Camera Exploratory Group that is hosted by Kronos and the European Machine Vision Association. Um, the goal of the group is to explore opportunities to standardize a camera API. This is something that was tried before by Kronos with the Open KCAM uh, API proposal years ago, but uh, the, the working group was shut down before any, um, any proposal was published. Quite obviously, we think that LibCamera is the right solution to this problem. In parallel to that, we also have multiple bilateral contacts with SOC vendors uh, to try and work on LibCamera adoption in the market. 
Speaking of vendors, we've already seen some of the advantages that LibCamera brings. Let's now have a look at what implementing the LibCamera stack entails for that. At the bottom of the stack, we have the kernel drivers. As long as they implement the Media Controller API, no change is required in the kernel side to work with LibCamera. This being said, if you want to upstream your kernel drivers, this may of course require changes as part of the review process with the kernel community. LibCamera has driven the development of extensions in Vita for Linux and the Media Controller to fulfill the needs of the platforms that we work with. We have also encountered ambiguities and design deficiencies in Video for Linux, and we work on fixing them. Uh, the LibCamera team thus has extensive experience with kernel development in the media subsystem, so we can also help vendors in this area if their platforms have needs that are not covered by Video for Linux yet. On a side note, it was quite an interesting experience of humility uh, to realize that some of the problems I mentioned in Video for Linux were actually in APIs that I had designed myself. And that's another lesson learned from LibCamera, a kernel API that only gets validated with uh, tiny testing tools, for instance, without a real user space stack, will most likely have defects. LibCamera is, however, a user space framework. It's not a hostile takeover of kernel development, so we cannot help vendors to bypass the requirements of the kernel community. On the kernel side, you have to do the homework and the get the drivers upstream. We have already seen that LibCamera provides an extensive set of helpers that help reducing the development complexity and development time by avoiding the need to reinvent the wheel. Um, the adaptation layer is also shared by all cameras, as we've seen, freeing the vendors from having to write and write the GStreamer support manually. The only components really that need to be developed specifically for a platform, apart from the kernel drivers, are the pipeline handler and the IPA module. That's all a vendor needs to do. This is the responsibility of the vendor. Of course, we can help if needed. Uh, there's extensive documentation. There are example pipeline handlers that can be used uh, to provide guidance. And we also here to provide support. A word on licensing, because it's important. The LibCamera core and the adaptation layer are licensed under the LGPL. This includes the pipeline handlers, which need to be published according to the license. The IPA modules, however, are not covered by the LGPL. Only publishing the code is required to comply with the LGPL. Upstreaming is not a requirement. We, however, strongly recommend upstreaming because the best results are achieved by working together. Forks are very costly to maintain. The kernel code, of course, is covered by its own license, which is out of scope for LibCamera. Uh, let's also note that both the pipeline handlers and the IP modules can link to third-party libraries if desired, as long, obviously, as the licenses are compatible. Closed source IP modules are fully supported, I mentioned that before, uh, even if we would like to encourage vendors to follow the lead of Raspberry Pi and open the algorithms as well. This presentation would, of course, not be complete without talking about the future of Lead Camera. I'll present here the features that we envision but haven't started developing yet. In the Lead Camera core itself, we have already thought about quite a few interesting features. We have per-frame controls today, but they are currently global to the camera, and we want the ability to set per-stream controls too. This could, this could allow setting, for instance, different digital zoom factors for different streams. We are also considering a higher-level use cases library on top of the camera to offer features such as zero shutter light capture or exposure bracketing HDR. Uh, both of these would be implemented by capturing raw frames pre-processing them in software and sending them back to the ISP for further processing. Two other important features that will eventually make their way in LibCamera are still image triggering with focus and flash support, as well as logical cameras. Logical cameras is something that's available today in many phones in the market. It's the ability to combine multiple physical camera sensors in order to create one logical camera. There are a variety of use cases for that, such as, for instance, seamlessly switching between a wide-angle uh, lens and a tele-lens when zooming in the image, 
or using multiple sensors to infer depth information in the scene, for instance. We really want to expand the number of supported devices. I've already mentioned ongoing work with the Librem 5 and a GPU-based ISP implementation, and we have ongoing discussions with more vendors. Support for older devices would also be great. I would personally be very, very happy to see the OMAP3 ISP, the one that started all this, supporting the camera, and finally bringing an open source camera stack to the Nokia N900 and the N9 phones. That would be a great community project. I would love to mentor that. So please volunteer and don't be shy. Paul Koshalkowski from Bootlin will talk tomorrow about his work on a kernel driver for an ISP phone in all winner SOCs. He has posted a code a few weeks ago for review, and it would be an interesting platform to support the Lib camera as well with a community-based effort. If you attend his presentation, which I recommend doing, don't hesitate to tell him you want to volunteer. We will, of course, continue working on the Android camera HAL and support the newer versions of the HAL API as they are getting developed as part of Android. Uh, support for additional features, such as zero shutter lag in Android, for instance, is also in scope. Leap camera wouldn't be very useful, of course, if it wasn't integrated in frameworks, in applications, and in distributions. In the frameworks category, uh, Pipewire is particularly in scope. But so are OpenCV, for instance, or Qt Multimedia, Electron, or just your favorite framework. On the application side, while Firefox already works with Leap Camera using v to emulation, uh, native support would be much better. Um, I was also very tempted to add native Leap Camera support to OBS when recording this presentation, but unfortunately didn't have time to do so. Uh, and I hope that many other applications will also follow. On the operating system side now, we're packaged by Chrome OS, uh, by BuildRoot, by Debian and Stable too, uh, and work is ongoing for Fedora as well. This one will take more time, but being included in Android AOSP is something that I'm really looking forward to. This concludes the presentation. The slides should now be available from the Linux Foundation website. Uh, I hope you found this interesting, and regardless of whether you're a user, an application developer, or a device vendor, please don't hesitate to come and talk to us. The LibCamera team can be contacted through our public mailing list and the IRC channel, and you can also contact me directly by email if you prefer. I am now available for questions in the conference chat channel. I would like to uh, thank you all for attending the talk, uh, and I hope that you will enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.